I know we're having a lot of fun out there, but let's, uh, let's get the meeting going. So good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everybody to the Board of Directors meeting for the Tri-County Metropolitan Transportation District of Oregon, known to, by everybody in the region as TriMet. So again, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, we have our regular uh, public forum, a regular business meeting, and a briefing today. And uh, we start our meetings with our public forum, where, which is the opportunity for the public to uh, bring items to the attention of the board that are either related to, to business on the agenda or other issues or concerns that, uh, that we have and uh, that you may have and you want to bring to our attention. And obviously, we can only deal with the issues that are under our purview. If you have other items, uh, we'll try to, to help uh, you find the right staff person here today who maybe can talk with you about the, air, the issue and get it, get it to the appropriate agency or agencies to deal with your concerns. Um, so I'm going to begin the public forum. Uh, and for those of you who weren't watching for the first time, we dedicate up to 45 minutes of our uh, beginning before our meetings for to the public forum. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet. People sign up. It's it, people come in and are called based upon their order of sign-up, uh, and we usually limit testimony. We only have three uh, three folks today, so we we can be pretty flexible on the the, the time. But I will ask people again to be uh, as brief as possible. But uh, we want to hear your your concerns. So why don't I call you up two at a time? And I'm going to ask uh, Jan Campbell, who is the chair of uh, our Committee on Accessible Transportation, and uh, Barbara Bernstein, who's with Elders in Action. Is, is, is she uh, both? Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you. So may I ask you both to come up? Good morning. She found the route up. I didn't understand how she was. <laughs> Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. So, Jan, I believe uh, you're first. I am. Good. How do you like my ramp? Isn't that well, that's neat? good. That's I didn't see the ramp, so yeah. I'm glad you found it. I, well, I actually did the access for this building. I had a job in the city for 34 years and oh. did ADA compliance, and that was one. But we didn't have these boards back here. This is nice. Now good. I don't have to worry about going off. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. No. And I chair the Committee on Accessible Transportation. And uh, we met last week and voted and for the um, honored citizens fair increase, uh, putting the um, dollar up to a dollar twenty-five for the single, and for the pass from twenty-six to twenty-eight, and everybody voted for it except there was one that one um, member that did not. And as you all know, many of us have been here to testify before. It's a very very difficult decision because seniors and people with disabilities, um, a lot are low income. And uh, it just makes it really, really difficult. However, we have not had a raise for five years um, with the fixed route. We have with the lift. And um, we just thought at this time, in order to get better service, that we needed to um, get some more funding, if at all possible. And when we get better service on the fixed route, we get better service on the paratransit, which is really, really important. And I think TriMed and CAT worked on that a few years ago because the boundaries, uh, it kind of changed a little with the paratransit, so the paratransit now, as you probably all know, follows the fixed route. So they go the same hours as that bus on that route and the same route. So anything that is enhanced by the fixed route enhances um, the paratransit. However, because it is so difficult, and I think you have, um, hopefully you have a copy of the letter, and uh, excuse me, I need to put on my glasses. I'm getting old. Um, there's a thing within the state that once you turn a certain age, which I have turned, and nobody will n know that yet, but how old I am. But uh, once you turn a certain age, you are no longer disabled. You become a senior. And so I am not disabled anymore. I am a senior. <laughs> and uh, we kind of laugh at that at the state um, when I'm on, when I speak at the state level. So. We strongly recommend and we hope that you will keep these promises um, that we're act actually asking you to do. 
And um, there's three things. One is to increase the access transit programs that provide fair assistance to community organizations that serve low income populations. And the discount offered to organizations on the purchase of honored citizen fares should be increased from five to 20% because these will be people that will have to go to these different groups um, to get a, a lower cost. And in order to do that, we're also asking to collaborate with partners to improve access to these programs and to expand the network by increasing outreach to community organizations to ensure that the people that need it, again, seniors and people with disabilities are informed about this. And we've begun working with TriMet right now, the CAC committee, to get the um, organizations involved and to do this outreach. And then the last one is priority should be given to improving transit service in the outer areas of the TriMet district, including complementary lift paratransit service where more and more low income individuals are now forced to live due to the availability of affordable housing. And that's what I was talking about, is that people, if um, this is really, again, important to me because if that happens, then also individuals wearing, riding the paratransit <coughs> will also be able to uh, get those enhancements. So I want to thank you, and uh, Kat wants to thank you for um, working with us and let us continue to advising you to effectively target these fair assistance to those who need it most and also to un help um, improve services for everyone, everyone to make our system accessible and fair to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions or thoughts for uh, Jan? Jan, I just want to say thank you uh, on behalf of the board and the region, frankly, for your service and also the service of all the other folks on the CAD. And I read your minutes, so it was clear that you had a robust discussion about this, did. this issue. And so I appreciate the, uh, the CAD committee taking uh, an action and making recommendations about how we can help deal with it and mitigate some of the impacts. So your, your thoughts and, and uh, uh, concerns are, are valid, and we really appreciate your thank bringing you. those to our attention. Well, we really, uh, and for myself, speaking for myself, for sure, um, really enjoy working with TriMet, and I think we've formed a good partnership, and we don't always agree, but we try to work some s something out so that we all are feel comfortable with it. So thank you for um, allowing me to chair the committee so, so far, and, um, and continue the good work. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Barbara. Thank you. I think you're going to hear some very similar things to what Jan said, but Chairman Warner and members of the TriMet Board, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Barbara Bernstein, and I'm the Interim Director for Elders in Action. Elders in Action is a nonprofit organization that advocates for and provides meaningful community engagement for older adults. Elders in Action staff and commissioners appreciate TriMet's effort in getting the word out about the proposed 25 cent increase to the Honored Citizens Fair. I have met with several TriMet representatives and attended the recent open house in March. We appreciate the work your staff has put into the public outreach on this. We remain concerned about the impact of this proposal will have on the most vulnerable portion of our older adult population. As has been noted in your public outreach presentations, 30% of the individuals using the Honored Citizen Fair are 65 or older, and 70% of them are people with disabilities. 50% of this population is low income. In short, the majority of these people using the fare are limited in their transportation options due to their abilities and income. For a lot of us, it's a choice and quite frankly, a privilege to be driven to work. But for most of this affected population, even an increase of 50% round trip will be a hardship. Good morning. Even, it may even be that they may sacrifice some other necessity like food or utilities. Unfortunately, as the costs go up for this population, their income does not. Given the financial impact of this decision, given, sorry, given the financial impact that this decision may have on the most vulnerable of the older adult population, your mitigation efforts will be of the most, utmost importance. TriMet should ensure that the access transit programs are increased to assist those with the greatest physical and financial need. TriMet should also work closely with Ride Connection and other area agencies to enhance emergency relief programs. In addition, enhancements to the TriMet service areas should target areas where lower income older adults and people with disabilities are concentrated wherever possible. As always, Elders in Action stands ready to provide input and assistance to the TriMet board and staff. 
We encourage you to consider carefully the negative impact this action may have on our most vulnerable older adults. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, good comments and good, good testimony. Thank you. Any thoughts or comments from the, the board? Okay. Thank you very much to both of you again. It looked like you wanted to say something else. I do because I also have something on the STFAC package okay. recommendation. And is this the correct time please, to do please, this yes. as well? Okay. Thank you. So, um, again, I'm Jan Campbell, and I co-chair the STFAC, which is a Special Transportation Fund Advisory Committee. And um, we did uh, last uh, couple weeks ago accept the package um, that you will have, I think, um, in front of you. It was a really hard decision, um, and I don't know if you know much about this, but it's state funding, and we have to figure out which packages we want to fund. And uh, this year we had less money from the state and we had more um, um, requests in. And the people that serve on this is Ride Connection, people with disabilities, as well as the smaller uh, transit agencies. And we really feel comfortable with the recommendation. We came in unanimously, we worked together. Some had to cut some things, um, but we wanted to make sure to be able to fund the existing programs to keep them going. Uh, but we unanimously voted um, for the package that you have, have in front of you. Um, this package, though, doesn't say that the need is met. And for sure, you all probably know that there is an unmet need because a lot of this, uh, this funding goes to uh, where there's unmet needs. So we're still working with um, patients that need, need rides for dialysis, medical appointments, school, and um, just shuttles within neighborhoods like in Forest Grove where they take you to the grocery store and to the doctors. So these are the types of things that, that are funded through this package. Uh, we're hoping to go to Salem um, and advocate for more funding from the state so that we can continue to move forward. And uh, we hope that we'll see some of you down there to advocate for it. And um, I wanted to share a couple of personal stories real quickly. One is I work on the helpline um, on call um, for aging and disability services. And we get a lot of calls for transportation because transportation is one of the crucial things for people to be able to, to do things, go to medical appointments, et cetera. And um, we hear that even for Ride Connection, they've called Ride Connection, but Ride Connection is not able to take them. And that's, again, because there's not enough funding and capacity for, for the need. Um, so that's another thing, you know, again, to show that there is an un unmet need. The other thing, and I don't know how you guys are going to go with this, but um, I know you all believe it, but I, I like to have fun. And if people know me, they know I like to have fun. But there's also a shuttle that goes up to Mount Hood. And um, that now, I, since my late husband passed, um, I would go to Mount Hood all the time to the lodge with him. And um, we would go fishing and then up to the lodge. Well, I can't do that. And I, m most of my activities now are in, within TriMet, uh, where TriMet goes because living here. And it's, it's just accessible. But now I can take TriMet to Gresham, Gresham to Sandy, and Sandy, and go to Welch's, and then up to the lodge. And I can go there with friends. And this is one of the shuttles. And, you know, it's very important for people and seniors to be able to also have recreational activities. So this means a lot to me because this is a way I can get out. I can do a day trip. Um, and so this is just one of the programs that this money um, funds. So um, I just want to thank you and hope that you do um, approve it. And then my last thing, as you all know, I always say, and some of us are closer than others, but you're, you're going to either be a senior and or you're going to become disabled and you may need these services or your friends or your loved ones may need these services. So just think about that too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, uh, questions? questions uh, no, uh, just for Neil, can you give, give me a, Jan, I, I'm, I am down there pretty much every day in the Capitol uh, for my organization lobbying uh, and for other things, but um, if I can get an idea uh, from, of, of the scope of what Jan is talking about and the need, uh, I'd like to have a look at it. Absolutely. We can. Not today. Me, I, th I think the truth is that the transportation committees are still working on a proposed program. Uh, we know what's been proposed to them. 
Mm -hmm. um, so we'll keep you in the loop on that for sure. And I don't remember the exact day uh, of transit day in Salem, but that will be, we'll make sure. April 18th. April, April 18th. And April we, no, 8th. 8th. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, April 8th. And we'll try to have a very big show. Usually Ride Connection brings a number of their clients and, and participants. And we usually run a, a bus of people down there as well to make the rounds and, and emphasize the point. So I think that will be really important. Well, uh, you know, I'd like to, yeah. Um, can you give me the number, a percentage of the population of TriMet, of, of the counties that use seniors and disabled? Now that I'm a senior, you know. When uh, Janelle comes up to give the sometime. Title VI presentation, even today, you'll get a little window into that as well. Great, thank you. All right, the last person we have signed up today for the public forum is Ron Swearen, and we do have a couple pieces uh, in front of us that I believe you probably brought this morning. Uh, your, uh, looks like an op-ed piece or opinion piece you did, and then a map uh, on this. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ron Swearen. I live at 1543 Southeast Umatilla Street, and I did hand out an article I had written for Oregon Catalyst uh, called Better Alternative to the CRC. And then I also handed out a map with uh, some major points on it. Map's kind of hard to see. It's basically showing a, a route connecting from US 26 across the Columbia to 39th and Highway 500 in Washington. Um, background, about 2005, I got into the fray on the CRC. <laughs> I just went to a citizens forum where they were asking people to submit some ideas. and. Uh, what we saw was uh, there was a sort of a tunnel vision that uh, the only way that the interstate uh, issues could be addressed was by addressing the bridge influence area of the I-5, which narrowed it down uh, very much to just a half mile wide area. Uh, but that flies in the face of, of typical interstate planning, which wa uh, would, in our situation with water barrier, put crossings at, um, at locations several miles apart, so you're serving a, gr a great area. Uh, uh, what I call the Western Arterial, I made a sign, uh, Western Arterial makes sense, and there's a lot of reasons why it does. It makes sense from a mass transit standpoint, it makes sense for uh, freight traffic, uh, it would make sense for uh, active transportation, uh, I've noticed Metro is planning a route uh, that's very close to this, and this would connect. Um, it makes sense for people that would commute between some of the areas that are experiencing growth. Vancouver uh, is having um, population infill, kind of similar to Portland, uh, not on the same scale, but I, I just saw they're building some large apartment buildings on the west side. and I. I think the west side of Vancouver close to the Amtrak station will probably be revitalized because it's a very under, underused area now. Uh, and then they're planning a waterfront uh, development. So um, basically in uh, proposing an alternative to the CRC, uh, a couple points I'd like to make is one, it's not just a highway route, but it's also something that can facilitate mass transit. Uh, I've been following the uh, development of community transit in Snohomish County, Washington, and their double-decker system. They call it the double tall. Um, these are very efficient express buses that uh, pick up their riders in uh, just a few areas and then uh, express into downtown Seattle with, I think, five to seven stops. And they're also able to uh, change the route during the day, uh, take the buses to where they'll, they'll be the most productive. Um, they've said sometimes they reach capacity, which is about 100 persons, 100, 110, I guess, on the double-decker buses. And these are done for relatively minimal uh, federal and state grants. So anyway, the I summed up the benefits of having a route that uh, completes a ring road. A ring road is a uh, fundamental um, element of urban planning where you have a major city, you want to avoid having uh, through traffic go through the center. Ring Road is the kind of the, the gold standard. Uh, and this is something that as a shortcut uh, would, would benefit all modes 
um, from mass transit uh, to freight to bicyclists to uh, drivers, whoever. So it's, yeah, I think it benefits everybody. So if you have any questions, uh, we're, we're trying, <laughs> you know, having been at this so long and then having some other ideas come forward from Washington that aren't really in, in keeping with this, you know, gives us some other targets to kind of confront, but uh, I think this is really the best solution. Thank you. Uh, comments? Uh, questions? Uh, I go ahead. You, you might want to, I was in a forum recently with uh, U.S. Congressman Peter DeFazio, mm -hmm. uh, House Minority sub Vice Chair of Transportation. Transportation. Yeah. You might want to send this on to him. He was speaking very forcefully about the importance of the CRC and how Okay. If you haven't met the congressman, he's he, he's um, he gets excited, and he's not shy. So. Uh, <laughs> well, there was a meeting in in Vancouver about three years ago, and he was there, and and then. Well, this was just like last week. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. You might want to send it down to his All right. his district office, in Eugene. I know people want a solution, uh, and this idea when this is shown to people, there's really a lot of support. It's it's just a general broad based idea. Uh, I found people in Washington, they keep saying things like, well, why, why can't we have the I-605 freeway? And, you know, they're driving oriented, and I know people in Portland uh, want other things. I, I've been supportive of the MAX, and, you know, I use the bike trails a, a bit, too. So, Any, anything else? No, nope. thank you very much. Uh, you. Uh, good luck on your endeavors. Uh, <laughs> the problem has not gone away. I think we all recognize that. Thank okay. you. I, well, I did have one additional person that signed up that I missed, and that's Chris Walker, who's uh, with our Committee on Accessible Transportation. Come on up, Chris. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, talking to you today about the um, proposed lift fare, I and mean not lift, uh, Honored citizen, my brain's not awake yet. So, honored citizen, fair increase, and the ability to um, see it from the point of view of the disabled honored citizen community, I mean, honored citizen people in our communities um, who have already probably are transferring onto the buses because they can't afford the lift pass and they're probably paying dollar by dollar as little as a time as they can. Um, I'm fortunate to be uh, blessed by having the, uh, because I'm on CAT, having my bus pass paid for. But I know a lot of people have the financial issues and I'm just thinking that maybe in uh, seeing it from their point of view and the uh, so their service was taken away and stuff. I know uh, several years ago when we were in down times, and now that we're in up times, supposedly, maybe we can uh, come to heads about possibly increasing or putting boundaries back or whatever we have to do to help show that, yes, TriMet board sees it that you guys are having a, have had been on the rough end of the, stick and we want to make that right right so anyway that that's just my point great thank you chris any comments questions nope thank you very much and we did have one additional sign up so i've had two more uh, another member of the cat uh, leon chavaria did i pronounce your last name correctly chavaria. okay please come on up couple of ideas. <clears throat> I tried to uh, I tried to see Commissioner Novick last year, but uh, the call was never in. I mean, I, uh, I never got a response. So I don't know what happened to that. I'm sorry, what? Okay, well, uh, <laughs> okay, here are the ideas. Okay. Okay, the first one. Here, 
to, the, to put this on Fifth and Sixth Avenue so that people, you can, you can cut that back, that's just to show you. So the, so the drivers, especially the drivers that come in on this, on this, during the summertime and don't drive downtown very often, at least it mirrors that thing on top so they know which way to drive and it won't drive, not drive, and it won't make uh, drive, bus drivers angry because they go in the wrong lane. Are there any questions? Did no, no I, you're trying to aid motorists in the downtown core area yes. uh, to, this, to not you, drive in the bus lane. Exactly. <laughs> the light rail lane. And you, you, um, can keep, you can keep this if you'd like. Thank you. I, sure. I think the signing was always a, a rather innovative down there, so I, I haven't heard many reports okay. about how it's going. So that might be a good one to just tell us if we're having any conflicts oh. or accidents. Oh. I'm yeah, I forgot. Um, I wanted you. I wanted to ask you if you knew should I contact ODOT or the city to get this done? Because one time I mentioned a traffic thing at CAT, and someone told me, and Jan told me to contact the city. So I don't know to, if I get want to get the city to paint this on. Yeah. Do I contact them or do yeah, I contact I, ODOT? Again, I think staff can help you, but I believe you are correct. The, the person is correct. The city of Portland, the, the Portland Bureau of Transportation, okay. who is and responsible for signing that. And and I would point out, just this is an inside baseball type thing. There's a, a little document called the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which regulates what people can put up in signs and can't put up in signs. So there's okay. some interesting things that, that I think the, the PBOT folks can probably help you with because I know they've explored a lot of things. So continue on. I just want to make sure you're aware there's some federal rules that come into play here that may limit some of the things you're able to do down there. Okay, fine. And this is the other thing. If a bus is turning on a corner, oops, it isn't more. If a bus is turning on a corner, a lot of times cars don't get out of the way. And then I thought, wait a second, if there's a bubble, uh, sorry, if there's a traffic bubble or something there, then they can just swing around. And whether it's a bus, a school bus, or an you can have those things perhaps beside, I mean, in front of a plant where 18 wheelers have to swing around. And maybe the city can, or like maybe if it's on a, it's on a uh, very busy boulevard and a bus turns on the corner 200 times a day, maybe people will get the idea that they have to use that space. Hmm. Those are just ideas. All right. Thank and, you very much for your... And I learned a long time ago, you have to mention your ideas. People can't read your mind. That's right. That's exactly well. right. That's right. And I, I uh, understand your frustration. My wife gets a little anxious every time she drives downtown and trying to okay. <laughs> go in there. So, so thank you for your comments and suggestions. Maybe we can have staff get yeah. these some right people to talk exactly. to. We'll, we'll provide you some contacts. Okay, thank you Good. very much. Good, thank you. Thank you. All right. Don't forget your real All right, well, that concludes our public forum. I want to thank everybody who came uh, this morning to uh, talk with us. Uh, we, uh, we appreciate it very much. With that, then, I'm going to move to our regular business meeting, and I'm going to call the, uh, uh, our, the Board of Directors meeting for March 25th, 2015 to order and move to our first agenda item, which is the board reports. And the first board report is on the Committee on Accessible Transportation. Dr. Bethel, are you ready to uh, provide uh, us an update? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you have a report of the highlights from the CAT committee um, in your packet this morning. And I know you've heard all several people speak from CAT concerning the honored citizens proposed um, fare increase. Would call the board's attention to, um, I believe in Jan Campbell's letter, there are three things that the CAT was putting forth as possible considerations for mediation that we would give that some consideration as that committee has forwarded those uh, recommendations or considerations to us as we consider the proposal for the honored citizens fair increase. I think that just about covers that on that part. If there's any questions from any of the board members, board directors, I would certainly be glad to answer them or point them in the direction for the correct answer. Comments? Thank you. Yeah, Jan did a very good job of outlining the discussion at the, uh, at the CAC committee. So uh, while you still got the floor, you want to give us a quick update on the TriMet Accountability Committee? Yes, TriMet Com uh, Accountability Committee met um, on last uh, Friday and during the meeting, and you will hear more this morning of a presentation about the TIAC 
uh, accountability centers um, website. Um, we have a great report in store for you on that, as we promise to come back and give you that report. We can also tell you that the Accountability Center at uh, TriMet.org has about 600 views per month. Uh, the most viewed information is, of course, the financial statements and followed by performance, dashboard, and ridership information. Thirdly, budget. Uh, fourth, the TriMet's leadership info, info and least um, has been that of public records. We also have taken a look at the website and the IT department there is beginning to do some work on the website to make it, and they use this term, um, to enhance findability. <laughs> and what that simply means is that when you look at that first page to be able to find what you're looking for without having to go through so many layers of trying to determine if one fits here, does it fit there, trying to list some more friendly user things on the web page for our customers and those who are needing to use our website to find their information more readily and quickly. Um, that's what I would like to give you from time um, from TIAC. And we are meeting now on a quarterly basis um, from our committee. And um, as we go through, we do plan to come back again uh, with another annual report or as when it's requested by the board. Any Good. questions? Yeah, just a question. I, you, you may not have the answer, but um, how much is, is this program costing TriMet? I don't have the answer. I, I don't need it right now, of course. Yeah. You know, it's just, I, I was going through my notes and said, oh. It's more in the the way work is done rather than as a lot of additional work. There is some additional work that we're doing related to really updating our document control and Correct. retention um, system. That's additional investment. But right. otherwise, it's more the way we are doing things as opposed to additional expense. But we can get those details. Yeah, I still here. like a number, yeah. please. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks. Good. Thank you, Dr. Bethel. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, let's move on then to the Transit Equity Advisory Committee. Uh, uh, Director uh, Saragoza. Yes, good morning, Board. Um, we had, again, another robust meeting last week. Um, a couple of the presentations, or one presentation was from Dee Brookshire on the proposed uh, 2016 budget, and there was opportunity to ask questions and give some feedback. The discussion that really that we spent the most of the time on and could not get through the agenda was really about um, the, ti the preliminary Title VI analysis of the mitigation to electronic fares. And there was a lot of concern from the committee on the impact of what it will have on uh, the disproportionate impact that it will have on low-income in uh, low-income riders. Um, I believe we will be we will be hearing from the committee um, or from folks on the committee that are very concerned about what that may do and the opportunity to actually be able to ride um, in a way that's going to benefit them and their families in terms of using um, the bus as their only way of transportation. So um, again, there's a lot of concern about that. Um, so I can I believe that we'll be hearing from the committee. Good, thank you. Questions for uh, the director? All right, thank you very much. Let's move on then to the Metro Policy Advisory Committee. Uh, director Prosser, uh, I know you've been out of out of town for a while. Did you uh, have a report from the last meeting? Um, I was out of town the end of February, so I missed that MPAC meeting, and MPAC has canceled both of its meetings in March, so I have no report. <laughs> You. So that's fast. <laughs> so I guess we have no questions of you then this morning. Oh, you can ask questions. <laughs> the answers. <laughs> All right. Let's move on then to the final report, which uh, Director Prosser asked you to also give a report on the Finance and Audit Committee. Right. And the committee met this morning um, before the start of this session. Uh, we got uh, a review of the uh, Strategic Finance Plan uh, Scorecard, which um, uh, Chief Financial Officer Brookshire is going to be presenting here, so um, we had a pretty good discussion about that, made some suggestions, and, and uh, are pretty pleased with uh, what, it, what the scorecard is showing. Um, we also had a discussion about the Honored Citizen Fair and some of the public outreach um, efforts that have uh, taken place with the letter from CAT and the mitigation. Uh, that CAT has requested, so we got an update on that. Um, General Manager McFarland and Bernie Bottomley have been 
um, in the process of, of contacting some of the business partners to update them on things going on here at TriMet and uh, some of the future issues. Um, so we got some uh, update on that and that we're hearing uh, some encouraging news and, and I think there's uh, also been uh, some appreciation expressed for um, the efforts that uh, TriMet has taken to address some of the financial issues that have been before us. So uh, that was pretty much it. So. Comments or questions? All right, thank you. Yeah, I would say that there were good presentations. We're going to hear those this morning too uh, a bit. So uh, it was good, good discussion at that, that committee. All right, with that then, I'm going to move into the general manager reports. Uh, the first is the general manager's comments from our general manager, Neil McFarland. Mr. Board President, members of the board, good morning. Um, and I have very short uh, comments, but one of the first things I wanted to do was to acknowledge um, the members of CAT that are here. I'm afraid I'm going to leave somebody out, but I do know that we've had a, uh, some very important issues that our CAT committee has addressed, not only this year, but in past years. And it continues to be a really important forum for making sure that our system is truly accessible or as accessible as it can possibly be to all members of our community. So the work they do is really invaluable and I wanted to acknowledge the presence. I know in addition uh, to Chair Campbell, we have Zoe Presson, Chris Walker, Adam Chris, uh, Arnold Panich, and as I don't know, I, uh, the, uh, the issue of this is I probably, John uh, in the back, I, 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 I knew I was gonna leave somebody out that I didn't see earlier, but again, thank you. Yeah, Adam, I did, I did mention Adam. So thank you very much uh, to all of you for your work and your deliberation on all of this. Um, I did want to also share uh, some um, challenges that we're facing related to our Line 15, which uses the Morrison Bridge. And as many of you know, our colleagues at Multnomah County have been challenged with a deck that is not behaving properly. Um, and uh, we've been told that they will both speed limit and weight limit the bridge here upcoming. The weight limit um, has been ordered by April 13th. Uh, currently our number 15 bus uses that, uh, that route. Um, as you know, it's one of the heaviest used routes in our system. Uh, so there are a lot of trips, I think something on the order of 150 a day uh, and or over a span of 15 hours that use that bridge. We will be de detouring the line, the line 15 to the Hawthorne Bridge that will add about 10 minutes of running time. Now our challenge with the short notice is that the schedules for both spring and summer are already in, already set and the operator signs. So we will need sort of two different solutions for this which we're working on with our service planning department. One is a, a solution uh, that will attempt to reduce the running time of the line uh, 15 so that operators can still maintain their break and the turnaround times at the end of the line. Um, and that probably means the line will be cut somewhat short at the east edge and then we'll run separate bus line or shuttle uh, to meet that, uh, that, those connections at Gateway Transit Center. And we're working out the details on the routing of that and we'll be working with our customers and our constituents in the neighborhood to, to make sure that's the case. Uh, again, open to other suggestions that the community may come up with, but we're on a pretty short timeline again to respond to this. Uh, as of the September 1st sign-up, we'll be able to accommodate the extra time in the schedule. But as you know, extra time means extra money. Our current estimates is this is something on over of a quarter million, uh, maybe a bit more uh, additional cost to us over the years. So uh, these things do happen. We'll be responding to it. We'll be stepping up the communication program with all of our riders, uh, including on board um, uh, communication with uh, the riders on the bus so that they understand what they're doing. Um, one of the unfortunate things when you detour to another bridge, you miss a number of stops as you approach each end of the bridge. And so that's one of the bigger challenges is to find um, other stops that will really do the work for our customers that they want the ex existing stops to, to have as well. Um, so we're working through that. We think we found uh, the, the right places to stop. Uh, obviously not equally as convenient, but uh, as, as, as good as the situation will allow. So I just uh, wanted to let you know that that is something we'll be doing and working with our, our customers here um, over the next few days, frankly, as we begin to ready this for the uh, detour. 
Chris has a question. Um, I have a suggestion. Recently, I was out with Bob Nelson and some other people from staff on the thank you part yes. of uh, for the drivers and asking members in the you know the public to say thank you and uh, got a very good response. Mm -hmm. And I think you know some of us yeah. You know, the point is, um, I think, think maybe we should have some people from staff doing the same thing for a couple of days on the bridge or around the bridges. Say, I know you're going to do the outreach and yep. email and web and every other darn thing, but you have a person with a TriMet uh, gear on saying, this is coming up. <coughs> this is going to happen. Uh, having waved signs there over the past 15 years during campaign season, there's a lot of traffic there. and. Uh, I just think it'd be a good a good gesture. We will do that. Yeah, you know, and maybe some. And Bob and I were talking about maybe next year putting signs in the windows of the businesses around the light rail or the bus lines, saying thanks. But maybe we do the same thing with the businesses over there, saying soon this is going to happen. Yeah. So I might know. I don't want to micromanage anything. <laughs> <laughs> We will do that, and uh, I would just an that idea. When my, my shorthand presentation, when I say onboard surveys, that's what I mean. We yeah. will actually be touch, touching base with the customers on the bus yeah. as well as at the bus stops, and that's what Ed Rosney's group uh, of customer service representatives do a terrific job of, and we'll augment that as as we can too okay. this year. Yeah. Thank you. Obviously, time is short, so we'll have to put some things in place pretty quickly. Yeah. Mr. So estimated time that this fix is going to need to be in place. Uh, I know it's tough to estimate, and I think I saw something uh, from Multnomah County when they originally announced this uh, that kind of estimated time, but this is going to be quite a long time before the fix is in place, correct? That's our understanding. So that's why we're talking about our fix, our response to it, mm -hmm. as a short term between now and September, and then once we will build into the schedules starting September, and that will be an ongoing um, effort and we'll just monitor the progress on the bridge to the fix. Follow up, is it months or years? <coughs> um, more mm -hmm. than a year, I think. Really? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. right. Thank you for that information. Um, second, and board member Esmond provided the perfect segue. I wanted to uh, just acknowledge the Transit Driver Appreciation Day that we celebrated last Wednesday, and many of our board members were, I thank you for your participation in that effort. Um, I think the frontline employees, at least that I talked to, were very appreciative of the efforts to be out there. Uh, and I would just also note that it's, um, it's uh, really um, rewarding to be out talking to the operators, and they're the ones who are the face of TriMet, and they do as you well know, they have a hard job. They are the masters of multitasking in the jobs that they do, uh, and they deliver literally hundreds of thousands of rides a, a day in a safe and, um, and convenient way. So we really do want to note our appreciation. We were able to you know, partner with some media outlets. Um, Drew Carney did a morning uh, bit actually trying to learn to drive a bus. I think he gained new appreciation for the skills that it takes, as certainly I have in the past whenever I've gotten behind the wheel. Makes my hands sweat um, handling the 40-foot vehicle. Um, and KPTV also did a, a, a bit on this, so we appreciate those, those uh, media partnerships celebrating, again, the great work that our operators uh, have done. So again, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that, the great work uh, that the operators do every day. Um, the other thing as I stood out for a couple hours around Pioneer Courthouse Square and you begin to watch this uh, complicated ballet of trains and buses running through the center of our city and uh, I think it, it is a place where you can really appreciate uh, what TriMet does for the region um, in, a, in a very uh, very visible way so again my appreciation to all the operators who participated and to all of you who participated uh, in that effort as well. That concludes my remarks. I know we have a number of uh, presentations, but if there are any other questions of the board, I'd be happy to respond. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, I was hardly any resistance from people saying to thank your driver. Yeah. Uh, that's very, very impressive. Very impressive. 
Um, I think um, our, uh, our customers uh, often thank our drivers on a regular basis. Um, I know the personal stories, my son-in-law actually is from Chicago. And he came here and he said, what is all this about people thanking the bus driver? <laughs> uh, but we have a culture of, of actually appreciating the great work yeah. they do, and I'm, I'm thankful for that on a regular basis. Certainly on transit driver appreciation day, but on a regular yeah, basis. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, can you thank these drivers? And they have a very stressful, hard job. So, oh yeah, damn right they do. <laughs> so, good. Well, let's move on to the second item then, is, which is the uh, preliminary Title VI analysis on the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail and related bus service and honored citizen fare change. So, uh, James Warren and John L. Bell will join us. Um, you recall this sort of as the preface to this that uh, leading to any approval of a major service change or a fare change, we are required under FTA guidance to do a Title VI analysis. Um, and we have really two analysis to share with you, as well as just an update on where we are with the topic that uh, Board Member Saragossa noted, which was the electronic fare Title VI analysis. And so that will be, um, is in process and is underway. So with that, let me turn it over to John Allen and Jake. Well, thank you, General Manager, and, and good morning to the Board. Uh, for the record, again, my name is John L. Bell, Director of Diversity and Transit Equity, joined by Jake War, our Policy Advisor. And I might just uh, add a additional note in acknowledging Jake. Jake's been uh, very busy the past several weeks analyzing this data, uh, which is no easy task. So uh, kudos to Jake for uh, handling such a, a very heavy caseload. Uh, we do have the honor and pleasure of uh, giving uh, to the board this morning uh, a much brief overview in the presentation here. You do have uh, the fuller reports, uh, some uh, maybe uh, 30 or so pages. Uh, but we'll cover the summaries uh, this morning. You'll recall that uh, TriMet conducts a Title VI equity analysis under really two uh, distinct areas, one of which is when we have a major service change like the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail, and the other is when we have uh, a fare change, such as the proposed honor citizen uh, fare increase and or the migration to electronic fare. Uh, so at this point, I'll invite Jake to uh, review uh, the analysis. And uh, you'll note that uh, we take a break after each section uh, with a slide indicating the section breaks. Uh, happy to uh, take your questions uh, either throughout or at the end of each section. Right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll walk you through, first of all, the analysis that we've done on the service changes related to the startup of the, the orange line, the PMLR, um, both in terms of the light rail service and then the, the bus service as well. Um, as a bit of background before I get into kind of the, the Title VI piece, of course through this process um, there's been an extensive NEPA review that has included environmental justice analysis of, of impacts to low income and minority populations in the corridor. It's been a years long process, um, but then this Title VI piece is really just once you have the details of the service changes, um, then you look at that at least six months prior to opening, um, and that's what this specific analysis is for. So I'll, I'll run you through that. Um, as an overview of the corridor and the demographics, um, through this corridor we, we have actually an above average low income population um, in comparison to the TriMet district as a whole. As a whole. We do have a below average minority population, um, which means it's, it's predominantly white, at least compared to the, the district. Um, service is increasing. Um, in addition to having the new light rail service, uh, leadership made a commitment to reinvest, reinvest any savings in terms of bus service hours back into the corridor. Um, so that's, that's a, another highlight. But then related to the, the light rail, um, replacing some bus service, we do have some service removed or, or reduced a little bit um, because of some bus rerouting, and so we'll go through some of that. Um, in terms of the service improvements, so we look at, as, as John L. pointed out in that overview, disparate impacts and disproportionate burdens, which is just different nomenclature for impacts to minority versus low-income populations. Um, and in terms of the service improvements, um, because of the demographics of the corridor, the service improvements are happening um, in areas of, 
a lower than average minority population for the for the TriMet district. Um, so that does flag, uh, in terms of Title VI, a potential disparate impact. Um, but then even, even having acknowledged that, because of that commitment to reinvest the service hours that were already in the corridor, we feel that that's still justified because that was uh, something we, that was already existing. We're not increasing service necessarily um, in, a, in a disparate way, but, but reinvesting where it already was. In terms of disproportionate burdens on low-income populations, because of the higher than average low-income population in the corridor, the service improvements do benefit the low-income population even more so than, um, than others. So with that, we, we conclude a no disproportionate burden um, as a result of the service changes, service improvements. In terms of stop removals, um, it's kind of the other side of the coin um, because now we're kind of talking about negative impacts where frequency on at certain stops might have been really high before but is reduced now or or service to some stops is going to, going to be removed, proposed to be removed um, to be served by uh, the, the PMLR. So again, because of the demographics, uh, the, the stop removals um, in terms of disproportionate burden where they are happening is, is in higher than average low income populations. So that flags that as a potential concern, a, a disproportionate impact on, on low income populations. Um, however, we looked really closely at the stops um, where this was occurring and found that ridership was extremely low um, at them. But still, we went out and actually conducted an ad hoc survey at the stops um, to ask riders if they were aware of the ch proposed changes, what their plans were, um, when that happened. Um, and, and for the most part, folks planned on using alternative service nearby, but we did, we did have a couple of folks who weren't sure what they were going to do. Um, and, and so we're, that's something that as, as, a, as an agency we might need to address. Um, then in terms of disparate impacts, again, the impact on minority populations, because it's that lower than average um, population found that there was no no disparity in terms in terms of that. So we'll go back to great. And, and I'm oh, I already went on. Yeah, here. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as Jake pointed out, we did do additional uh, research. Uh, it's always one thing to conduct the analysis, uh, but we always like to take an additional step and, and proof test uh, our uh, conclusions. And so we did do additional surveying. And as Jake pointed out. Uh, what we found was uh, while uh, more, uh, more than not, uh, most folks did have alternatives, uh, there were uh, some that did not. Uh, and we also found that uh, the boardings uh, would be low, uh, so it did not necessarily warrant uh, the necessary investment uh, to mitigate that potential impact. Uh, but that being said, we do go through, uh, like a, a NEPA process, an alternative analysis, if you will. Uh, and so, some of the options that we considered uh, following the analysis uh, were, uh, you know, one of which is to provide rationale for why we ought to move forward with uh, the stated policy. Uh, two, to mitigate, to mitigate, uh, or three, to minimize, or four, to avoid uh, altogether. Uh, the recommendation that's on the table is to move forward with uh, the service uh, changes and that's justified really uh, in two uh, distinct areas, one of which is low boardings, again, only 40 boardings per day, uh, but also the cost uh, would be uh, roughly $250,000 a year uh, to have that additional service. Uh, so from our view, it did not uh, nece necessitate uh, a necessary investment in that, in that respect. Okay. Any, Any questions at this point about the... <clears throat> See none. Keep okay. Keep we'll move forward with Honored Citizen. So we've heard a little bit so far, uh, well actually quite a lot from, from folks about the Honored Citizen proposed fare increase. And so this is the, the Title VI analysis, which is similar to a uh, service analysis like we did with the PMLR, but looking at the impact of, of fare changes. A little bit more straightforward in terms of the analysis. Um, and well, at least I, I hope so. I'll try to communicate it that way. Um, so I guess just a little bit of background to back up on, on the honored citizen fare increase. Fares have not been increased on honored citizens since 2010. Um, 
this was partially in agreement with the community on accessible transportation as you know that as we phased in the lift fare increase we would freeze honored citizen fare increases um, where they're at but historically we've tried to keep it at about half the adult fare um, at least for, for the single fare and so the goal here is to get it back up to that half at a sustainable level um, in, in order to provide better service for honored citizens so the questions we assess in the Title VI analysis were essentially two, and that is, does increasing honor citizen fares disproportionately impact minority and low-income riders, just the, the premise of increasing honor citizen fares, and then do the specifics of this fare increase proposal disproportionately impact those groups? So in answering those questions, um, so we looked at the, the nature of the fare increase. Um, for it, as a reminder, here, here is the, the current and new fares proposed. You see the single and day pass are proposed to increase by 25 cents and 50 cents respectively. But then the other products, the pass products, um, are, are proposed for a much smaller increase um, from the seven day, 14 day, 30 and annual. It's all the same um, percentage increase, about 8%, but a, a smaller increase than the 25% increase on the single fare and day pass. So in this analysis, again, along those same lines, minority and low-income uh, impacts, we found that in, in terms of impacts on minority riders, we did not find a disparate impact. It wasn't disproportionate because, um, as, as it turned out, the people of color are actually underrepresented amongst honored citizen riders, which um, was, was kind of a surprising finding. Um, and they also use the fare products similarly to non-minority honored citizens. So there's about the same rate of single fare usage and pass usage. Um, so in terms of the impacts, while, while it's, it's an impact for sure, we're not, we're not saying that it's no impact, but it's about the same level of impact for both minority and non-minority honored citizens, according to our analysis. Now in terms of low income populations and honored citizens, should be no surprise that low-income individuals are overrepresented amongst honored citizens. Um, so that in itself, because they, they take 63% of, of honored citizen trips, that flags it as a potential disproportionate burden, and so does the structure of the fare increase, because single fares are proposed <coughs> to increase more than the pass, um, and low-income honored citizens do use single <coughs> fares more than higher-income honored citizens, if that makes sense. So then Jono will talk about, again, our process for looking at options. Thank you, Jake. Um, and again, in assessing options to mitigate uh, the potential uh, disproportionate impact, uh, we recommend that if the board does approve the honor citizen fear increase, uh, we hone in on two uh, com components, one of which is to mitigate uh, by allocating resources within the mitigation program uh, to honor citizens, right? So we further our outreach and efforts uh, to community-based organizations and nonprofits serving honor citizens, and that we increase the marketing uh, of the seven-day and 14-day pass programs and continue the downtown uh, pass programs, which uh, is a very important resource for honor citizens. Moving towards a great, great. So is the assumption, uh, excuse me, I got is the assumption that all honored citizens are, are lower income? Not all, but they are disproportionately lower income, yeah. And how do you know about the lower income? It's based on our 2012 fare survey, which is the most recent data we have, where we asked people about the fares they paid and then also gathered information on income, household size, things like that. And, okay, thank you. In reviewing the, the public engagement, we've had a, a pretty robust public engagement element of uh, the proposed honor citizen fare increase. Uh, we received uh, feedback uh, from both our CAT committee as well as our Transit Equity Advisory Committee. Uh, both of the committees uh, generally uh, have agreed uh, to support uh, the fare increase, uh, but I should note it was contingent upon uh, TriMet moving forward with uh, a mitigation uh, element, and I think uh, Jan Campbell uh, captured that sentiment correctly. Uh, moving forward, uh, leading up to uh, the board decision on this item, uh, we'll have uh, various uh, community forums. In fact, 
Uh, Martin Gonzalez from our Public Affairs Division uh, has already led several, but uh, will be leading a pretty robust community engagement effort all throughout the Tryman Service District. Uh, so there are, uh, are ample opportunities for folks to both weigh in on the website as well as uh, in person, and that is all being communicated and have been mailed to uh, impacted, impacted riders. Digging a little bit deeper on the proposed mitigations, and, and I should note that we pulled together a roundtable discussion uh, with uh, nonprofit executive directors and leaders uh, several weeks back where we propose uh, our mitigation strategies. In addition to that, we also did bring this proposal forward to CAT and TIAT, uh, similarly to how we uh, rolled out the, uh, the low-income mitigation program that we currently have. And essentially what we uh, described are kind of three areas of how we would uh, move about a mitigation. Uh, one of which is to expand, as I noted earlier, the access transit mitigation program. Uh, second is to uh, be more proactive and target our outreach towards honored citizen organizations, organizations serving honored citizens and uh, folks with disabilities. And then a third is to increase our current subsidy, uh, which is at 5% to 20%, so a 15% increase. Uh, we presented this and uh, the roundtable agreed that this would be uh, a really uh, important step. So next steps in uh, refining uh, sort of the mitigation effort, uh, we will be having uh, additional meetings with uh, nonprofits and CBO uh, leaders, uh, really having conversations with them uh, as to how they'll implement uh, this uh, new mitigation strategy. Um, much of what we're already doing uh, will apply uh, but we want to be uh, flexible and um, uh, amendable, if you will, uh, to some of the additional needs with serving uh, new organizations. Um, we'll also continue to uh, accept feedback, as I noted, on the proposed policy. Uh, I think we've already received uh, quite a bit of feedback uh, just from uh, online, but we'll receive certainly more at the community forums and sessions. So there is ample opportunity for folks to weigh in. Questions on the honor citizen? Um, you indicated that about 63% of the honored citizen fare users are low income. Um, we're working mitigation through nonprofits. Do we know what percentage of that 63% are already connected to nonprofits? And if they're not connected, is or what kind of efforts would be made to connect them? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Director Prosser, that's an excellent question. Um, we, we do not have data uh, which, uh, you know, indicates a percentage of those covered. Uh, the difficulty in that, as you can imagine, is uh, pretty widespread. Uh, but it is true that uh, in order to benefit from uh, this level of mitigation, you would need to be connected to community-based organization or nonprofit. Uh, what we'll do, and this is true what we uh, do with our uh, current uh, mitigation program, for instance, I receive uh, calls routinely through 238-RIDE where folks are looking for a direct subsidy. And what we like to do is connect uh, those folks with the organizations who can serve them. Um, so part of the conversations that we'll have with these community-based organizations uh, is around uh, availability of uh, their caseloads uh, so that we know which organizations could uh, potentially take on more uh, clients uh, uh, so that these folks can receive these fares. Uh, but we'll also be having conversations with Ride Connection, uh, who administers our current mitigation program, uh, to uh, figure out if we might uh, not be able to create an emergency relief fund, if you will, uh, for those who uh, absolutely need uh, relief. Uh, so those discussions are uh, moving forward at present. If a uh, follow up. Um, for people who are, are already connected to these organizations, and you, you mentioned um, some of the casework that they do, so there's additional services that, that they're providing. You know, if I'm a low-income honored citizen, and I, for whatever reason, don't want all those other services, um, and I connect with one of these organizations, can I just go in and get the fare, or do I have to go through their full program? 
Uh, uh, Director Prosser, that, that's a case by case, um, sort of a scenario. Uh, uh, each of the organizations are run uh, differently. Uh, but I will tell you, many of the organizations do just offer uh, fairs. Okay. Uh, one of the unique characteristics uh, moving forward uh, will be, uh, in the past, we've not focused on uh, honored citizen uh, sort of mitigation program because it was already subsidized at such high levels. And so I think what you'll see is uh, the increase in size of our current program to include organizations serving honored citizens and folks with disabilities. Uh, so in many instances, uh, folks may now be better served as a result of these new mitigations uh, than they are currently. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Director Stovall. Thank you for the presentation. Greatly appreciate the hard work on crunching all this data, Jake. When we think about Title VI and, it's, and the requirement from FTA, I, I start to think about our mitigation opportunities and what we're, what we're proposing and whether or not they fulfill the requirements of the FTA. If the FTA looks at it and says, well, you know, there is you know, disproport disproportionate, I can't even say that, <laughs> disproportionate uh, impact, how do they measure us as far as our mitigation recommendations? I mean, do they come back and say, well, you didn't mitigate enough or it needs to be more? And the second part of that question is more of a, uh, more of a comment is, do they take that and say, well, based on national, st national norms or averages, most transit agencies are 50% of the normal fare, uh, and so you guys increased it, for, you're, you're, you're just getting to that point, and so is there any of that in the consideration when they're looking at our mitigation efforts in comparison to other transit agencies and what they're doing to ensure that what we're proposing is going to meet kind of the FTA's standard as far as mitigation efforts? Director Stovall, uh, excellent question. A uh, couple things I'll say uh, to that, one of which is uh, I always uh, avoid venturing off to uh, conclude what FTA will think. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave that up to our general counsel, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> um, but what, what FTA requires is that uh, transit properties uh, go through a thorough analysis process, right, and that uh, we uh, determine potential impacts, we assess that, uh, assess those impacts, and then we have a proactive conversations with community about those potential impacts. It does not prescribe what a mitigation ought to look like. Uh, and so uh, you'll note that uh, even when thinking about uh, options, one of the options is to provide a business case as to why an agency is moving forward, uh, like with the PMLR. Uh, so f let's use PMLR for one example. Uh, one approach uh, could be to move forward with uh, the $250,000 a year uh, you know, cost to impact, uh, to mitigate uh, only 40 boardings. Uh, so that's one potential option. Another option is to make a business case because in the greater good of a mass transit agency does not necessarily make sense in terms of the best investment. Uh, so in looking at the honored citizen uh, overall package, uh, there are uh, certainly true that FTA allows for a number of ways of either uh, doing nothing at all moving forward. Uh, FTA does allow for uh, transit agencies to have the honor citizen fare at 50% of the adult fare. Uh, so we're within that context. Anything above that uh, is certainly up to uh, a transit agency. I, I guess I would add there's, there's a lot of language that uh, is fairly meaningless from, from FTA, but it keeps it pretty gray. <laughs> you know you said that out loud. Uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, uh, I mean, for, the, for the record, Mr. War said that, not Mr. Bell. Uh, so there are certain... I'm sure it's a private Right, There are certain words like uh, avoid, minimize, mitigate, where practicable, and they don't go into detail about what practicable means. There's uh, a phrase, substantial legitimate justification, hmm. if, if you do find a, a disproportionate impact. So you can provide a substantial legitimate justification, but what that means, again, is there's, there's not more to that, really. So it, I think they do base it a lot on peer practice as well as, I mean, it could be some, some uh, subjective judgment, but what happens behind the curtain is kind of a mystery. <laughs> yeah. and, and the other component to that is the public engagement. I mean, one of the mm -hmm. things I, I do know, and speaking with our regional civil rights officer, uh, probably more than I would like to admit, 
is uh, FTA looks at uh, how uh, transit agencies proactively engage their constituents with respect to proposed policies. And we're certainly doing that and beyond. So, I mean, the, uh, those, are great, those are great comments and uh, answer to what I was looking for. It's really about context. I mean, the context of our solutions and not po possible ways to mitigate this impact you know, does it fit in the larger scheme of things so there's not a gotcha, you know, six months down the road or 12 months down the road, you know, from them, you know, from the FTA looking back at us and saying, okay, yeah, you, you found that it was disproportionate impact, but yet uh, your mitigation didn't go far enough. So just, you know, the context of what we're looking at here to ensure we're moving forward with something that's, uh, that's something that's reasonable. So appreciate the answers. So we still have one final piece, just unless we've got more. So I just want to make sure we got the the timing of this correctly so w sometime later this spring we will be we'll be taking uh, action or considering action on the increases of, of the honored citizen fare as an example and then go ahead I'm, no, I'm just gonna so to that uh, in the uh, April meeting we uh, uh, a first reading and public hearing of two ordinances one related to the the fair uh, the honor citizen fair and the other uh, related to the service plan for Portland, Milwaukee. Gotcha. A major service plan change will also come before the board in that regard. So that will be first hearing, our uh, first reading and public hearing in April, and then consideration of the board would be right for, for the May meeting. Okay, and related to that then, we will have at that time staff's recommendations in terms of levels for increases of the low income mitigation program. <laughs> it's any other specifics you've got there. Yeah. And when we take action, on the ordinance to, to make those changes, that triggers actual submission then to FTA with, with those figures, or is it, or does this go to FTA before we take action? I'm trying to just make sure I understand the. Uh, yes, President Warren, that's an excellent uh, point and question. Um, so uh, TriMet is not required to uh, submit the equity analyses to FTA uh, until our next program submittal. Uh, our practice has been we uh, give. Uh, a courtesy copy to FTA. So, uh, in fact, uh, prior to the board uh, actual adoption, we'll uh, send a preliminary report okay. to our regional civil rights officer. Okay. That's what I want to hear. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Now continue on to Ether. All right. So, <clears throat> the, yeah, the final piece that you have um, in your packets from us is. Uh, is a, about eFair and Title VI analysis of the transition to eFair. So a brief update on, on where we're at with this. Um, given the, the scope of the transition to eFair and how big it is and how, how transformational it is, we opted to hire a consulting firm to lead the Title VI analysis on this. Um, so we have a, a firm that's, um, their name is KFH Consulting. Um, and they have done a lot of work, and um, one, of the, one of the pieces is a preliminary analysis that's provided to you, in the, um, and it's called Technical Memo 2 Preliminary Analysis of, of eFair. Um, and the results of that analysis, at least at this point, um, in terms of uh, poten potential disproportionalities um, and benefits and burdens, are that in terms for, for low income and minority populations, um, there are two components of the um, what's proposed currently for, for eFair that have the potential to benefit um, low income mi and minority populations to an even greater extent than, than others. Um, and those are caps on, on fares, as, we, as we've talked about, that would limit the amount that riders pay um, at a daily level and also a monthly level. Um, if they're using the e-fare cards. And then also the expansion of, of the retail network um, where folks can buy and load their, their e-fare cards. Um, the, as the network is proposed currently, um, it expanded to over 500 locations throughout the district. And we've done some geographic analysis um, to, to look at what populations um, those would those would serve, and it's actually higher for minority and low-income populations. Um, so those those are just a couple components that um, so far look positive. Um, but then we do have some concerns that we've flagged so far, um, and that are those are how we're going to proceed with um, onboard transfers for those paying cash, as well as day pass purchases, um, the elimination of those. If, if that were adopted, could present some, some Title VI concerns. 
as well as what the minimum loading is onto an eFair card. Um, in talks with, with retailers, our eFair project team has um, been negotiating what, what is that minimum load, what are they willing to sell at their, at their um, stores, um, and what that dollar amount is. So those could present some issues for low income and minority populations that as we go out to the community, which John and I will talk about, we will want to get a better idea of the impacts on the ground so that we know how to address them. Great, thank you, Jake. As Jake pointed out, uh, we are uh, in the very uh, early stages uh, of uh, this process. We've conducted the preliminary Title VI analysis. Uh, the next steps, uh, we want it to be proactive and intentional. Uh, so uh, we uh, have required our consultant uh, to work with our community-based community partners uh, in offering a series of focus groups to hear directly from uh, trans-dependent writers of how uh, these proposed policies may impact them. Uh, so that will be happening uh, April, May. Uh, in addition to uh, the more targeted outreach, uh, we'll have um, uh, surveying occurring at all of, not all, but uh, a good portion of our transit centers, what we're calling uh, sort of pop-ups, and that will also occur May, June. Uh, and then we'll have a series of community forums all throughout uh, the TriMet Service District, uh, hearing from uh, folks about what they think about the proposed policies uh, with respect to electronic fare. Uh, and of course, uh, working with our TriMet committees, uh, as uh, Director Saragosa pointed out uh, last week, the Transit Equity Advisory Committee did have an opportunity of, of sitting with the report and providing their initial reactions. Uh, we'll continue to keep uh, that committee engaged uh, throughout the course of this process, but also helping to inform our community engagement and we'll be working with uh, CAT as well uh, to ensure that uh, we uh, receive uh, their feedback. All of this in a package, uh, the bottom line is to help inform uh, the board's uh, final policy decisions and strategies, uh, which occurs uh, sometime in the fall of uh, this year. One, one other thing to note is um, that the policy decisions will be essentially adopted as, as a fair change. So that's why this brings in the Title VI um, analysis is because this all is, is part of the greater fair change. Good. I bet you we probably have some comments and questions. Who wants to go first? Go ahead. Yes, Director Sargoza. Um, just um, coming from the meeting last week again, there were just some concerns about the impact of actually um, if the cash fare goes away um, in terms of how much folks can load. Um, and one of the things that one of the TAC members said, which I really hadn't thought about previous to that, was that we've talked about people can load their 250 or $5 throughout the month. But then what's the benefit if you get at the end of the month and your pass has been paid for? Um, you know, so you're not being able to use that the next month because it's all happened at the end of the month of the amount that you need for a monthly basis. So um, if it's $5 for, you know, you use 10 times in a month, what's that going to get you at the end of the month? I mean, you're not, um, you've already expended what you can expend. Um, so it's no benefit um, to, the, to the folks. I don't, I, I see some, some cons Yeah, I mean, I I, I think there are some, some real issues here, and it does resolve around, um, you know, not everybody is frankly um, moving forward in this technological society we have. And so how do you begin to equalize for the fact that we've got um, both financial and technology gaps amongst parts of our population that we need to deal with? And so I think it related to some of those, the, the caps, Remember, there's also a daily cap, so mm -hmm. that's a helpful thing for everybody. Um, and again, I think, I'm not sure I do my math right, but if somebody uses the daily cap 20 times, the rest of the month will be free. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I still think that's a, that's a benefit. Um, it may not be the benefit of the early part of the month, but it would be a benefit later in the month. Right, so, so that, that was a concern that was brought up depending yeah. on how folks use that. Um, in terms of what's the benefit if they've used it 20 times at the end of the month, right, then right. it's not a benefit right. to them. So that was, that was one concern. And also the cash amount where 
folks who are obviously transit dependent and are low income, and if they just have that 250 that they can do, and it's it's they don't have a card. I know we're going to cards, but there were some concerns that were brought up. How will it uh, benefit or support folks who just have cash? Yeah. You know, so again, that was um, that was a concern. So those yeah. are two of the major um, issues that I heard that yeah. were concerns. Good concerns. Are there Go ahead. I want to follow on what um, Director Quinto said, and it has to do with what will be the minimum load on e fare cards. Um, sometimes I don't have five dollars in cash in my pocket to have lying around someplace else. <laughs> uh, but um, seriously, for many of the low income riders and who will be impacted by this, being able to have sitting on a e fare card a certain amount on each card I can see can certainly propose uh, oppose a impact to an individual. And I, I would think of uh, many single mothers um, who have two or three kids and they have to pay. They're beyond that age, no school bus pass, uh, they're elementary. And if they have to have $10 or so on each card, that's a lot of money invested in a card just to, to carry around for a little while. So somehow as we look at this impact, I'm hoping we'll be able to come up with something that will make it easier for them to um, load their cards and not have to have such a high minimum um, or some type of program, something to address that so that we don't have that type of impact when we do the e-fares. Um, just, uh, just, uh, yeah, uh, my response, uh, board member Bethel is one of the, the dynamics here is that as one reduces the minimum load requirement, you probably also reduce the uh, number of uh, participants in the um, retail outlets because it becomes less, becomes more of a bother for the retail rather than sort of a benefit for them. So we're looking for the sweet spot, candidly between the participation of multiple or the most retail outlets as we can get because we see the benefit of that and um, and the impact on, on low-income writers, as you noted. So that's the balance that we'll be seeking and getting some uh, guidance on as we move through this process. Okay, thank you. What's the universe, the population estimated? In terms of what, director? The, the, the Title VI, you know. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, so, you're, you're surveying, you know, for oh, this. What's, what's the universe in terms of folks we're surveying? Yeah. Oh, I'd say. I mean, a, a ballpark. For, so for, like, the basis of, of this analysis sure. that we've looked at? Sure. Again, it's, it's uh, the, the same data source as we used for the Honored Citizen, which was that 2012 FAIR survey. Um, I don't have it in my pocket. Right, right. So, so that <laughs> you don't carry it around. I do. Um, no, I I we'll, carry we'll, the FTA rules, right. but I don't carry. We'll any, get uh, your copy, direct as well. Right. <laughs> that that survey, sir, uh, was it was around I want to say seventeen thousand um, survey responses they received. So it's a really good sample. Of responses. Our mm -hmm. And is there a is there a multiplier effect? You know, you add ten percent of the people, non responses. Oh, well, I, I'm not sure that we know how many didn't. Um, okay. I, I'm not sure exactly what the return rate was. We could ask our, our okay. research department. That's fine. To you. But it's statistically confident, right? Yep. Yeah. But then as far as um, population, if you were kind of getting to that, the, the Title VI, so just as an idea of our district. Um, yes. So minority population in our district is about 27%. Um, and then low income as our definition, um, which is 150% of the federal poverty, yeah. level, it's about 22% of the district. It's about a fifth. Of a fifth in these three counties. Mm -hmm. And the climate service, service district. Gee, I, I wonder if people next door know about this. Thank you. Yes, I just had a, um, to remind me, what's the age when children start Seven. 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 <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
So more to come on this one. I, I suspect there will be a lot of interest and discussion as we move forward. Uh, and there's a lot of thorny questions and issues we need to resolve. So look forward to your expertise and uh, uh, ingenuity and, and creative thought on how we move forward here to, uh, to not impact people in a, in a negative way, but rather provide them a, a, a new tool that actually works better for everybody, which is what I hope I think we can do here if we do it properly. So look forward to your continued uh, refinement of this as we, as we move forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you, President Warren. Mr. Board President, we have uh, another uh, presentation. We'll try to pick up the pace here a little bit. Uh, I think our next uh, is safety outreach during uh, testing of trains, and Harry Supporter will give you a little update on what we're doing because people are beginning to see buses and trains on the new alignment, um, and it's very exciting, uh, but there are also risks and hazards associated with mm -hmm. that, and I'll have Harry address what we're doing to identify that. Good morning. Good morning. President Warner and board members. Um, one of the primary goals for opening the uh, Portland to Milwaukee Orange Line is a safe opening. And there are several steps that are being taken to assure the safety of pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists during these various uh, startup activities. So as you can see, uh, there are a number of things that are ongoing right now. Um, in addition to the, uh, one of the startup activities is the integrated testing that takes place. Um, this requires the operation of trains and buses, and buses because we do share some of the corridors with buses, to test the functionality of train signals, traffic uh, control devices, power substations, and other systems. And in, in, and in addition to that, um, we will be conducting bus operator training, um, rail operator training, and then there is simulated service. So there's quite a bit of activity. And uh, these movements are taking places in areas where buses and trains have not previously operated. So this is going to be pretty new to those that live, attend school, or work in those uh, geographical areas. And to um, help assure the safety of pedestrians and cyclists and motorists, there is a safety outreach program that's been uh, developed, and this is led by the PMLR Community Relations Team. So uh, the picture that you see up there is a, uh, we've deployed safety ambassadors uh, to key areas, and um, they are there to inform the public that buses and trains will be operating through the area. So we do this in advance, just prior to the deployment of the trains and buses. Uh, and you can see that we also put these A boards out, um, and that's uh, to remind them that um, it's, uh, it's important for them to understand that the signals that are there are fully op uh, functional. Uh, they need to be obeyed, uh, and they need to look both ways. This is a theme that we keep emphasizing over and over again, look both ways before crossing. And um, uh, the safety ambassadors are there to help convey the, uh, the message that, uh, uh, that this is all important and to help to reinforce that. The other... Um, function of the ambassadors, not only to inform, but also to solicit feedback from the public. Um, do they understand what the control devices are? Are the th are, is the signing confusing? Does it seem to work? And um, they are also recording compliance with those ob observations. And we then begin to collect this on a weekly basis, and uh, I think you are aware that training has started already. It started um, just this week, um, or rather the, uh, last week. And uh, we're beginning to compile this information, and we are uh, putting it together and saying, is there opportunity for improvement? Um, in addition to this, the safety ambassadors, we also have an extensive outreach um, to schools, social services, neighborhoods, business associations, and other groups. And these messages are being uh, uh, placed in ads and they're posted on their TriMet website. And this is an example of some of the uh, messaging that is there. Um, we post this uh, principally in English, but we also recognize that there is a non-English speaking community out there 
And um, so we also offer the uh, messaging in an alternate language, and that's principally Spanish. So as you've heard in the past, um, there's an extensive outreach to the schools. Uh, there are 17 schools that are uh, less than a mile from the uh, rail alignment. And um, uh, there are nine schools that are less than half a mile from the alignment. And all of these schools are being provided with this type of messaging as well. Um, it is being offered. We know that there are a number of uh, Spanish-speaking students uh, as in English is their second language. And so it's being offered in that alternative language as well. And um, in addition to the materials, we're also offering a number of uh, safety rides. And uh, this will be starting in the, in the May timeframe. Um, in addition to the schools, there's an outreach There's an outreach to uh, universities, uh, principally that's PSU University. Um, there we will be uh, providing them with the materials so that they can distribute the materials at uh, student fairs and we will provide representatives uh, as appropriate uh, with business uh, and neighborhood associations. We're also contacting them, providing them um, with the materials and we will attend where it's appropriate. and. Um, uh, attend the community meetings. Um, in addition to this, we're also publishing these materials in newspapers, and these are the community newspapers, um, to reach the uh, community that may not be English speaking. Um, it's placed in El Sp Hispanic. Uh, then there's the Asian reporter and the scanner. So we're looking at a broad audience to reach as many people as possible. So as you can see, there's really an extensive outreach. It includes safety ambassadors. Uh, that program will continue as we uh, continue our uh, startup activities. There's safety messaging, and it's being done through a variety of media. And, um, and we're engaging civic and student groups. And that overall theme is you know, to be seen, be safe, and to look both ways before crossing. So um, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you for the presentation and for all the work. I know that this is crucial whenever we you know, provide new service you know, on rail. It's kind of raised a question in my mind. Um, along that alignment, we're also doing a lot to reroute buses and, and there may be neighborhoods and areas and even schools that are now getting bus service or at least bus traffic by them where they haven't had it before. So do we do a similar kind of outreach to people along those bus routes? Um, you know, I honestly don't know the answer to that quest question, okay. but I will definitely find out. But, um, but our outreach doesn't only um, isn't only unique to the um, uh, to these uh, rail extensions. Um, it, we we try to message throughout the year to a wide audience. Mm -hmm. We do have uh, materials that are available to schools, um, and uh, we provide them uh, with those materials so that they can um, engage the students in understanding uh, the bus service, not just the rail service, but the bus service. And, uh, and what's the appropriate behavior around those buses, how to act safely. Yeah. You know, I, don't, I don't know that any of our new routes are going near schools. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I know that we do provide information to schools. I'm just wondering if there should be some quick look at, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about areas around schools, um, daycare mm -hmm. centers, you know, those areas where kids are likely to to I, congregate and just to let them know hey a bus is now coming near you know, it, it's going to have great benefits but you also need to be more aware sure so I, w I will um, that that's a great comment I will um, find out mm -hmm. and 
I know our community relations folks are in the audience today. So I will be speaking with them and seeing how we can address this, that concern. Good. Thank you. Very, quick, very quickly, Harry. Thanks again. Um, um, how many crossings are we talking about on the orange line? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I knew the answer, answer at one time, but I, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it has escaped me, sorry. Okay. But it's, uh, you know, there's a number of crossings, and uh, uh, we have crossings, obviously, in the existing system, so the Orange Line is not unique at that respect. There are a couple of um, locations that do present its challenges. Uh, that's per, uh, one of the reasons for the safety ambassadors. We're gaining input. And we're always reevaluating the information. So as we have that information, we'll make the adjustments as necessary. Okay, thanks. And I guess I just also point out my thanks. I had the opportunity to be out at the, the nexus of the uh, new light rail bridge, Moody Avenue, and the new uh, OHSU building, which has a significant amount of students coming in and out. Um, and I think the added kind of uh, just challenge for us is what we've got now is this facility is finally done I mean it's it, but for for months you know the the line has been people have been able to walk across there unimpeded right. and uh, now we're going to be starting to run light rail vehicles buses uh, soon when the openings of the, the, the pedestrians bicyclists um, are all going to be in that area and, it, and there's an example of an area where you know, we got to train people now. So I appreciate your efforts to get out there and get people trained to, to obey signals and things because there is a lot going on there uh, and a lot of people. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the reports on area and how, how our, our compliance is going down there because that truly is a, a big area with lots of conflicts. <laughs> Absolutely true. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on then to the uh, ethics uh, hotline update. All right, as, uh, I'd like to invite, invite Darlene Gastonow, our internal auditor, and uh, Chris Middleton um, to come up. Um, and you recall that out of the outcome, and as Board Member Bethel has updated you over a period of time, of the Secretary of State's audit was the recommendation that we established an employee hotline to report waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, we've had that under operations now for a quarter or so, and so actually six months, and so we wanted to give you an update on how it was going and uh, yeah, the update. So let me turn it over to Chris and Darlene, and thank you. Thank you, General Manager and uh, Chairman Warner and uh, members of the board uh, for this opportunity to cover the six-month review of the Ethics Point Hotline. Uh, again, my name is Chris Middleton. I'm a paralegal with our legal department, and I'm with Darlene Gastineau, who is the manager of our internal audit department. Uh, so in keeping with the Secretary of State uh, audit recommendations, one of their recommendations was to set up a ethics hotline for employees to call in with potential fraud, waste, or abuse concerns. And we believe that is in keeping with TriMet's vision, mission, and goals in terms of keeping us accountable and uh, in terms of providing resources for employees to use for all methods of reporting. The hotline does focus on investigating these specific reports of fraud, waste, or abuse, uh, including elements that might have theft, embezzlement, falsification or misrepresentation of books, uh, records or financial statements, and also just general waste of agency assets. In setting up the hotline, we did want to acknowledge and address that sometimes a report might come in that concerns safety or human resource issues or other issues that are usually investigated by other departments and should be referred to them. So part of that setup of the uh, ethics point hotline was to include an assessment of the type of case when it came in. <laughs> With setting up in t the launch uh, of the hotline, there were many employees and departments who were touched mm -hmm. by uh, the hotline. But it does primarily involve four groups. 
primarily uh, the Accountability Committee, of which uh, Dr. T. L. Allen Bethel and General Counsel she Shelley Devine are members. They spearhead the uh, initial uh, mission <laughs> and set up an implementation and also oversee the hotline in and of itself uh, and its developments. The legal department is also involved in terms of the practical administration of the hotline. They perform an initial review of uh, reports and concerns when they initially come in, in part to assess the type of concern that is coming in. Additionally, the internal audit department represents the values of TriMet and assesses the investigation or conducts the investigation of these instances of fraud, waste, and abuse. These groups are supported by a third party vendor called Navex, who actually sets up and runs the hotline itself. Uh, if you call in the number, you're talking with an operator as part of Navex. They also have the web portal for employees to use to submit reports. They have the back-end functions to continue supporting the reports and the investigation, and they serve as a channel of communication between employees so that they can make these reports anonymously, but also can follow up and receive feedback and comments as those investigations continue. With uh, launching the hotline in September, uh, we did provide multiple uh, promotions and uh, spread awareness through an employee town hall. Uh, our general manager announced the launch of the hotline that was combined with spreading awareness through employee communications uh, and publications that are distributed. And overall, we have postings about the Ethics Point hotline along with the actual number to call and the w or the website to visit to make a report. And with those postings at our facilities, <clears throat> there's also uh, information on our internal network, TriNet, which again has that hotline number and that web page, as well as some frequently asked questions and general information about what to expect when making a report. In terms of recapping some of, uh, or reviewing some of the progress of the hotline, again, it launched specifically on, uh, on September 24th of last year, and thus far we have received seven cases. Uh, one of them was received in March, uh, and the investigation of that case has actually subsequently closed, but uh, that happened after the opportunity to change this specific visual. <laughs> so forgive me on that. Uh, but with those seven cases that came in, the legal department uh, performed the initial assessment and determined that three were concerns of fraud, waste, or abuse of resources and needed to be uh, investigated by our internal audit department uh, to further see those claims and see those concerns. Four other cases that came in did primarily involve or need action by other departments, be it security, human resources, or even our operations and training department, proved to be a vital tool for addressing the concerns that came in. We wanted to track the investigation and closure of both of these types of cases to be able to support our employees and address their concerns, making sure that there is follow-up with all of the investigations, not just the ones that we deem are the type of, uh, that apply to the Ethics Point hotline. So in terms of uh, generally, particularly with the closing of the March 11th case, it actually took an average of 14 days to resolve, fully investigate, and take action on a case. Of that, uh, specifically the type three cases took uh, about 12 days to investigate. And an average investigation, or investigations in general, the shortest one took five days to complete, but the longer ones took as many as 20 calendar days to complete. We should specify, this is talking about calendar days, not business days 
overall in terms of our timelines. Where that leaves us in terms of moving forward with the future uh, is that for uh, being launched in six months, uh, we see that the hotline is still young. It's still developing. With that, the Accountability Committee can continue to oversee the development of the hotline and, the pro and oversee the progress of it. Additional, uh, additionally to that, we have not had any substantiated findings thus far for our investigations, but any investigation that does have a substantiating fi finding will be uh, reported to the board. And above all, uh, you will see an uh, annual summary report of the developments uh, and uh, general findings of the Ethics Point Hotline, either within a year or uh, as recommended or requested by the board. Uh, with that, uh, I think I've spoken a lot to the administration of the hotline and its setup. Uh, and being a member of the legal department, um, I do love to talk a lot. But I did want to provide the opportunity for Darlene, who has a few comments as well. <laughs> Good morning, President Warner, board members, and general manager McFarland. I just wanted to be able to supplement Chris's uh, presentation with a few um, additional words. Uh, as everybody knows, the ethics hotline has been up and running for about six months, and just to assure everybody that the process has been going very well. We've developed policies and procedures. We have assigned accountability. Chris mentioned, for example, the uh, potential reports of fraud, waste, and abuse are actually researched by the internal audit department. That's very consistent with our mission statement of doing internal um, assessments and objective assessments to be able to ensure that concerns are properly resolved and researched. We also have built-in internal controls, which is consistent also with our, um, um, our department. Um, for example, reports are all numerical. That helps ensure that all reports are properly accounted for. We, um, Chris also mentioned, we monitor for the turnaround times to ensure that um, people, the concerns are being researched in a timely manner. And then just finally, um, we work very closely with the Accountability Committee to provide updates, status, and also to fine-tune and to enhance the process. So with that, Chris and I are available to take any questions or comments that the board may have. Good. Yeah. Is this, this a, is there one person sitting, oh, no, sh let me think. Yeah, I would like to see a report in, within the, you know, the, a year to date and, and how much, uh, how it's going and how much Certainly. it costs and how much time it costs for the organization to do, to follow up. That's something we will definitely be able to provide yeah. the board. Thank you. Dr. Bethel, do you have any other comments you wanted to No, no other with? comments. I'm just, uh, one thing that I do want to say uh, is that the Secretary of State's um, audit did require that we do this. And we have actually done a very, very great job. But one additional thing that they did not ask us to do that this has presented and it is being provided by TriMet is that when there are other complaints that are, or concerns, or I won't say concerns, that's the word we agreed to use, that have come up, there are also some that are coming in through this ethics points hotline, and those are the ones that we're referring to the other departments. So that's an added plus that we've given as a result of doing this to TriMet employees as well as the organization. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. We'll look forward to the, uh, the next report and, and the annual, annual summary and information. Thanks a lot for the thank report. You. Thank you again. Okay. All right. So, Mr. General Manager, does that conclude uh, your report for this morning? It does. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. We asked for this. That's what we want. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we're doing this. So let's move on then uh, to the next uh, item on our agenda, which is the consent agenda. And uh, again, as I say most every meeting, this, the items on the consent agenda are considered routine and can be passed by a single motion. Um, however, any member of the board can remove an item from the consent agenda if they have questions or wish to uh, consider it separately. So first off, I'd ask, uh, there's two items on the uh, agenda. Uh, first is the, the board meeting minutes from February 25th, 2015. And then the second is a resolution 15-03-12 which is authorizing a contract with Cardno GS Incorporated 
for facility sustainability and asset management program development and implementation services. So with that, does any member of the board have anything they, they wish to be removed from the, uh, ever moved from the uh, consent agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion, I have a second. Ready to call the question, is there any uh, further discussion? All right, then all in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to our resolutions, the next agenda item. The first resolution is resolution 15-03-13, which is approving the 2015-17 uh, biennial special transportation fund uh, formula and supplemental grant funding and endorsing federal 5310 funds uh, disbursement to provide coordinated public transportation services for seniors and persons with disabilities and then finally authorizing agreements with transportation providers a lot a lot in that title uh, and, a, and, a, and again, I'm going to turn to you, uh, uh, Mr. General Manager, to give us a staff report on this. But I'll also remind the, anybody listening that we did have a, uh, a couple people testify on this earlier, so we did get some input from the public on this. Mr. General Manager. Mr. Board President, members of the board, this is, a, this is an important resolution. One of the key duties we fulfill under the state guidelines and in cooperation with ODOT in particular which is allocating the special transportation fund that is allocated by the state legislature uh, to service providers. And as uh, CAT Chair uh, Jan Campbell noted, this is a group that we pulled together and you actually had a resolution at the last meeting to, uh, dealing with the membership of this advisory committee where we then seek guidance uh, from them on the most efficient and best uh, investments related to serving uh, seniors and people with disabilities, which is the purpose of these funds. Um, as as uh, Chair Campbell noted, there are many, many needs in our region in this particular vicin this area. And I think one of the key um, points of this is that what we what is very important to TriMet's bottom line. Number one, we're a recipient of some of these services, but the other and frankly more important part is that by providing these supplemental services, we can actually draw down some of the number of rides that we provide with the paratransit system and provide better and more tailored services to uh, seniors and people with disabilities. And so these efforts around the region are really very key to us keeping uh, frankly, the growth of the overall paratransit program at a, at a reasonable level, which is sustainable with our budget and allows us to provide, I hope, even better service to those who are eligible for that service. Um, but I'd also note that, um, again, uh, the advisory committee does a lot of hard work, a lot of hard decision making associated with um, uh, making these, these, these trade-offs amongst the pro projects. And there is a great deal of effort to try to spread the benefit around this to various elements of our community. And to note that there are also uh, representatives from outside the TriMet District uh, and funds are allocated outside the TriMet District to providers, for example, in Canby and, 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 um, and other uh, outlying communities. So that is also included in this. Um, we also, uh, these funds also support some of the more innovative services that we see around the region. One example that gets a lot of, um, and, and uh, Jan mentioned, is the uh, Grovelink service in Forest Grove, where, where there's actually um, s uh, a, a shuttle service connecting to some of the key destinations within Forest Grove, but also providing great connections to our Line 57, which is kind of a lifeline to many people in Forest Grove to the rest of the region. So uh, again, we always wish there were more of these funds uh, to go around, and indeed that's one of the requests to the Oregon Legislature this year is to consider ways to enhance this funding program. Um, uh, and again, that will be subject to their deliberations over the next few months. Um, but with that, I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. I also have two of our staff members who worked with the committee here, Alan Lato and Hannah Ritchie, who are available to answer any questions that you might have. Great, right, thank you. Does the board have some questions? Well, me yeah. again. What was that again? I said me again. Okay, good. <laughs> it's yours. Do the counties also put money into the, the into this into these services? Um, 
my, you, my sense is that it's a case by case basis. In some cases, the counties do, yeah. uh, and they supplement other programs. But I, I couldn't answer the specifics. Maybe Hannah can help us out. <coughs> Morning. Board President, members of the board, yes. Um, to answer your question, um, it is a case by case basis and it is um, mostly uh, based on population. And so, um, depending on the makeup of the senior and people with disability populations, that really guides how much of the STF investment goes into the total cost of the programs. I think his question is no, you're asking. No, my question is, is there's lots of needs. I mean, we said that, and not, not only in transit. Uh, uh, do, would Washington County or Clackamas County or Multnomah County, where'd you come from? <laughs> <laughs> do they put money into this to help out? Do you know, if you know? I think that's okay. so, um, And you're? Bernie Bottomley, mm -hmm. the Public Affairs uh, uh, Director Esmond. Uh, they do put money into these programs. Uh, they don't, the money doesn't flow through TriMet. So in many cases, these dollars are going to supplement programs that the counties are also underwriting okay. um, through a number of avenues, veterans affairs programs, community development block grant uh, funded programs and the like. So this is just the state funding that you okay. see here. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did, sir. All right, All right. thank you. Um, any other questions? I, I guess just before we take action on this, I think this, uh, you pointed out there, there's a lot of needs out there. And I think I pointed out, for example, the Grove Link is one of those programs where the federal support for that program and the few others around the region is going to expire at the end of next fiscal year. So this is be gonna become more important and I think the the desire and how we can actually grow this pot of money to to uh, to uh, maintain some of those services is pretty critical for the region so uh, i can't stress enough how important it is for these monies to be there and and also i i think if there's any help down in salem to con con continue to get additional resources for this that would be be very helpful but i think the challenge that this time next year we're going to be uh, we're going to be uh, asking probably a lot more questions and it's going to be a little harder to make the decisions absolutely yeah and I'd be willing to do my part. So I'm, I'm going to guess a lot of these legislators probably may not be aware of the programs. Maybe they are, but they may not be aware of where the money comes from. And that's, that's important. How will it affect their own backyard? All right, then. Is uh, is the board ready to make a motion, to, a motion. A, to approve resolution 15-03-13? And I believe we have a motion. Second. We have a second. Any further discussion, questions, or comments? Okay, then I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 15-03-13, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. It's approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to the last resolution we have this morning, which is resolution 15-03-14, which is approving the proposed fiscal year 2015-16 annual budget for submission to the Multnomah County Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission. Mr. General Manager. Mr. Board President, members of the board, I wanted to just very quickly go through the budget highlights again with you. Uh, and then we have uh, Dee Brookshire and happily one of our new staff members, Nancy Young, who you may remember from other uh, in engagements with us, um, to actually review uh, how the budget stacks up against those policies, the strategic financial plan that you adopted last summer. Um, let me sort of go through a few of the key items in the budget. We do have a really quick PowerPoint associated with this, and you have it available. We'll get it up here on the screen. But again, the priorities for this budget are to uh, open Max Orange Line safely and successfully, uh, expand service and improve reliability, advance our culture of safety, and demonstrate good financial stewardship. Uh, the overview is that this is actually about a $505 million budget uh, with a $122 million capital program that doesn't, in addition to that, there's $229 million in the light rail completion um, program associated with that, with the Orange Line. 
Um, just related to the orange line, just to note, a uh, major service increase for us, $8.5 million in investment. Um, service will be every 15 minutes, 10 minutes in the peak. Um, great connections throughout this corridor. Um, and uh, the project is on time, on budget, and preparing for September 12th opening and operation. And then you certainly know quite a bit about the, uh, the ramp up to that operation as well. Uh, related to um, our other sorts of budget highlights, we have uh, $1.1 million in frequent service restoration, $2.5 million in bus peak capacity and frequent service restoration uh, and service enhancements, uh, and an additional $730,000 in bus schedule reliability efforts. And we're continuing to renew our fleet. This is the year, this budget year, that we actually achieve our goal of uh, an average age of eight for our buses. Uh, also includes lift vehicle replacement as needed and some uh, work beginning and continuing hopefully in the future on some of our operating facilities which have um, been uh, ignored in terms of investment for a while. Um, we have a number of customer improvements underway, um, track improvements and platform finishes on the MAC system, uh, the electronic fare system which again would go into a full um, operation in 2017 with some tests in 2016 um, and a number of other customer facility improvements as part of the capital program. And again, related to safety and security, we continue our investments in operator recertification. Uh, we have a number of crossing improvements where we have land use changes that are particularly driving um, additional pedestrian traffic and, and changes in the vicinity. Uh, and we're continuing our uh, upgrade of the uh, closed circuit TV system, which is a multi-year program. Um, related to our financial considerations, there's no base fare increase. We are ask, asking for consideration of the honored citizen fare increase, as we've talked about earlier in this, this meeting. Uh, the budget includes the accommodation of the two and a half hour transfer extension that the board approved uh, that was effective the first of this month. Uh, we maintain the fair mitigation program, and we maintain our share of the Portland Public School uh, PASS partnership program. We meet all of our goals in the financial uh, strategic financial plan related to pension funding, uh, related to wages. Uh, the union contract calls for a 3% wage increase, and the same is recommended uh, as uh, merit and performance increases for um, our non-union employees. Um, debt service, um, again, uh, would be a new issue. We'll bring that separately to the board for consideration as we go through that. Uh, but again, this still, as Dee will show you, st is well within the bounds of the strategic financial plan uh, guidelines. In diesel fuel, I just wanted to know, this is, is a, perhaps a little different than what was in the advanced material. Um, it was budgeted last year at 315. This year, it's budgeted at $2.75. Um, to be um, candid, we're continuing to watch that because so far in fiscal year 15, our average has been $2.42. So we'll look to see if there's some reasonable change we should make in that, although we don't want to be too gung-ho about how long these low, low diesel fuel prices will continue. So just the general um, outline ahead, uh, we presented to the board uh, the, the budget on March 11th. This is, as you know, an important step in the process where we approve it for review by the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission. Uh, they will hear, hold a public hearing together with you on April 22nd, where we'll actually review the budget with TSCC. Um, and again, the first reading of the ordinances associated with the budget, and that deals with the Honored Citizen Fair and the service plan, primarily for Portland, Milwaukee, would be considered at your April 22nd meeting uh, and then the budget would be proposed for adoption uh, May 22nd. And again, uh, then the budget year begins uh, July 1st. Um, just generally, I've been very pleased that we've been able to add so much service uh, back in such a short period of time. Uh, I think this is really great news for our customers, uh, as well as maintaining and improving the reliability of system overall. So I think it's a very positive budget, um, but look forward to your comments and thoughts about that. And um, we could pause here for questions, but I know Dee and Nancy will go through uh, the strategic financial plan policies next um, as part of this uh, presentation. <coughs> yep. 
clarify the honored citizen fair in um, increase is that are the revenues and the mitigation actually built into the budget or is that something that we would be taking separate action on later we'd be uh, doing that separate. separately it's not built in we didn't want to okay. presume a board action uh, yeah. in presenting the draft budget that was my understanding I just wanted right. to clarify Thank you. Please. Good morning, President uh, Warner and members of the board. Let's talk about how we did in terms of the strategic financial plan. Uh, recall that the strategic financial plan was actually put into place on July 1st of the, at the very beginning of this fiscal year it took place, uh, but it was developed over the course of the last budget season. So we'll start with the first one. and. Uh, the first one is a priority for use of increased revenues from payroll tax resulting from increased regional employment growth and fares resulting from increased ridership should be given to restoring and expanding service. So what we've done is pull together our uh, payroll tax revenue for fiscal year 15. We've applied the fiscal year 16 real growth estimate of 6.2 percent, come up with the payroll dedicated to new service number of 18 million fifteen thousand four oh two our fifteen fiscal year twenty sixteen passenger revenue is estimated at hundred and twenty three million two hundred seventy one thousand six oh six so when we subtract our passenger revenue from fiscal year fifteen we come down to passenger revenue dedicated to new service that would be the expected growth of four million one hundred forty seven thousand nine fifty six so our total revenue that we are working with is twenty two million one hundred sixty three thousand three hundred fifty eight so we've annualized the cost of all of the new service that we are bringing forward in fiscal year 2016, and that comes to 18,692,000, with a, a difference of 3,471,35. Oops, got an extra number there. Anyway, so that's uh, what we've got here is uh, something that we believe demonstrates that it, it meets this particular retire requirement because the priority of the money that's available is going to be used for new service. Any questions on that one? Okay. We like it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Let's move to number two. Uh, this one is an interesting one. This is, um, we spent an incredible amount of time evaluating this and working through um, different scenarios to see if we could come within uh, this particular guideline. The guideline, which has been expressed by Director Prosser very generously, is a growth goal, <laughs> and is uh, current service costs should not grow faster than general inflation. So we are using the Eco Northwest forecasted fiscal year 2016 Portland area CPI growth factor, which is estimated at 1.7 percent. So we've pulled the total operating requirements. We have subtracted the additional costs for fiscal year 2015 revenue, the fiscal 2016 costs of new service, and as you can see the array of things we've subtracted there. I'm happy to answer any questions about any of those. Bottom line is that the total cost of service is estimated to be 373.2 million in fiscal year 16, which is 3.6 percent above fiscal year 15. So it doesn't meet exactly the, the particular requirements of this guideline. However, I would point out that we have had some incredible percentages of growth. We have 3% for wage increases. We've got uh, changes in premium costs that exceed that, plus we have approximately 2.7% in our non-labor cost increases. So, so if, unless there are any other questions about this, just understand that we are continuing to explore alternative ways to measure this. I um, went over this at the Finance and Audit Committee meeting, and, and I think we had more discussion on, on this guideline than any of the others. Um, and, uh, you know, the guideline, I think, is working as we intended. It was intended to, as, uh, as I say, of a way to kind of push us to do better. Um, but it is, and when we first put together the strategic finance plan, there was also a lot of discussion about this. There were some uh, people that felt that the wording was not tight enough. It should have been shall not rather than should. Others felt it was wait, um, we should be much looser. We shouldn't have it at all. So we tried to hit kind of a middle ground here. The other thing is that um, the uh, 
Finance and Audit Committee agreed as we put together the strategic finance plan, this is actually a measure that is going to be more useful over time. Um, what we see here is a year-to-year -year comparison. Um, next year, presumably, we, we'll, we'll see a little bit longer time period. And so the fact that this measure is not hard and fast meeting the goal, um, it's something that we need to be aware of. It's something that we need to look more closely at. And it's something that we need to um, focus on as we go forward. I don't think it's um, something that says we failed right now. So it's, I just wanted to put it in that perspective. Well said. I guess I just add from the Finance Committee, it was, was very robust discussion on this. Is I think the definition of what current service is to and what's included in that not is, is still looking to be refined. And so we look forward to having some further discussion with this as, as, we, as we get smarter about it. But I think it is accomplishing exactly what uh, Director Prosser expected, which is making us take a hard look at the growth of our, of our programs and providing current service levels at minimum. So, good. Thank you. We'll move on to number three. Uh, TriMet should always maintain appropriate financial reserves consistent with TriMet's fund balance policy. The fund balance policy speaks to unrestricted fund balance at 2.5 times the appropriated average monthly operating expenditures for the upcoming fiscal year. We have done the math and the significant numbers are there and we've come to a ratio of 3.2 going into fiscal year 16. Now this represents our undistributed net assets with, for the, the organization and it does include unspent capital program funds and also the, the effects of the lower diesel fuel rates that we've been experiencing. We are anticipating that over the course of the next few years we'll have a little bit more trouble meeting this ratio and so we wanted to keep additional funding in the fund balance to help us keep our goal, meet our goal in upcoming years. Any questions on that one? Okay, moving on. <clears throat> Fair policy should strive to balance growth in ridership and passenger revenue, improve the customer experience, and mitigate costs for low-income transit-dependent riders. Well, we like this topic so much, we even threw in a few things that probably are more related to service enhancing enhancements to the customer experience than strictly fair policy, but we'll include them. <laughs> so, uh, so we have no general fare increase proposed for fiscal year 16. Uh, we have a continuation of the 1.3 million low income fare mitigation program. We have a con continued advancement of e-fare, the restoration of weekend service and increased service reliability, accelerated bus replacement, extended service time from two to two and a half hours, and the added service through the opening of the Max Orange Line. <coughs> Excuse me. Questions on that? Okay, moving on. We've broken up number five into two. We think there are two s s distinct sections to this. One relates to the capital assets and state of good repair. The other one relates to the use of debt service. So, <coughs> For capital assets, we have a list here. Uh, we have 122 million in capital-specific maintenance and replacement plan for a PMO for the, the organization, and not this is non-PMLR related. You heard a presentation at the last board workshop from Dan Blocker on the capital uh, program itself. Uh, we have a continuation of accelerated bus replacements, which, as uh, General Manager McFarland noted in his presentation, brings us to. Uh, the eight-year average for our buses. Uh, it's a significant outlay of capital funding for this organization, but we will always have some level of bus funding annually, so probably something in the 20 to 30 to 40 million dollar area, so we'll keep you abreast of all that. The four million to improve our customer facilities, six million for positive train control, 1.2 million for GPS locators, and 37 million in investing in updated technology. The second part of this one, of number five, which is involves the use of debt. The use of debt should be minimized and never exceed TriMet's debt policy. So we have two things going on with our debt. One of them is our senior lien debt. The other one is our debt related to PMLR. So we are focusing just on the senior lien debt because the PMLR debt will be extinguished once we receive our federal funding. So 
We have a number that's slightly different than you see in the budget message. We were calculating, we included one small piece of the PMLR funding, which we, we finally filtered that out and came to 4.5% as our senior lien debt service to continuing revenues ratio for this year. So questions on that? Just a quick comment. The last time I asked you about the recycling of buses, mm -hmm. um, I knew where that came from. Uh, many, when I was living on the East Coast, I forget who owns the trains in New York City or the subways, but they were, they were out of service and no good, and they were using them for artificial, artificial reef. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> well, we put our buses up for auction, yeah. and we find that the highest bidders tend to be the folks that actually just want to uh, use it to, for the metal, yeah. to salvage the metal. Um, and so occasionally you'll have someone that will want to buy it and live in it, but <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. uh, but the buses, this cycle of buses, uh, and there are folks in the audience that could speak to this far better than me, is that they were quite old. You know, we're talking about getting rid of, of some really old buses, yeah. and so the maintenance on those has been extensive. Um, you know, they're probably not worth quite as much. You know, I know at the agency that I just left, it was a full CNG agency, and when the CNG buses were, were had completed their useful life, which was limited to the life of the tank, uh, which was 12 years, 14-year tank at the most, was uh, $500. You know, that's an $800,000 investment that after, at the best, 14 years, it's only worth $500. So it's just a feature of the business that we're in. Somebody could do something. Okay, thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah, but, I, but I think your question was, are there other op opportunities for people to reuse these in innovative ways? And I guess we, we would be open to any opportunities, right? In terms of, course. of somebody wanting to approach us about doing something like that. Not sure that's that would fly in Oregon, but uh. oh yeah. If you have any ideas, we'll put you in touch with the right person. Okay, thank you. Sure, and the last one is our related to our pension trusts, and so the the guideline is that within 15 years the pension trust should be fully funded and the other post employment benefits OPEB liability reduced by 50 percent. Once the pensions are fully funded, the same stream of funding should be dedicated to OPEB funding under the OPEB liability until the OPEB liability is fully funded. So our board adopted pension funding plans began in fiscal year 2015 with a 15 year amortization schedule for the union plan and a 10 year amortization schedule for the non-union plan. Uh, the union plan is currently funded at 73 percent and the fully, the non-union plan is now funded at 87 uh, percent. Related to uh, our pension funding for fiscal year 16, we will be dedicating $25 million to payment of the union plan and $5.5 million for the non union plan. Uh, we're continuing to maintain our OPEB uh, plan in the pay go status, which means we pay all of our expenses as they come due. We invest $21 million a year in that. So we noted that the, app, the national average for pension funding is about 73%, so we're hitting that on the union plan and we're way exceeding that on the non-union plan. Mm -hmm. Comments or questions? What's the percentage on PERS right now? I'm you know sorry, that? I don't have that. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> Never mind. Anything else? Other questions, no. comments on this one? I, I guess I just want to say how important this is and, and and I think the uh, obviously the, the the agreement between the union and, and the management has helped this a lot, but I feel really good that we're really focusing our efforts to to get those plans fully funded on the, on the retirement side, and then after we're done there, being able to start attacking the OPEB liability. I I think uh, it's pretty amazing what we're doing here. So uh, congratulations to staff on this one. Thank you. So, other questions or concerns on this one? All right, Travis. <clears throat> Another question or concern, as was referenced earlier, we had an opportunity to review this by the Finance uh, Committee earlier this morning, uh, but just more so a comment. Uh, you know, as we set out to develop the strategic financial plan, it was really the idea 
that it'd be something that would cause this conversation or these type of conversations to occur so that we had the long-term uh, sustainability of the organization in mind as we made these year-to-year -year financial decisions. And coming back and having this report is, is very, very comforting. You know, that many of the things that we've set out to, to achieve and we collected a lot of stakeholder input as we went through this process to develop this. And I'm encouraged, you know, certainly that we're, we're making a lot of great success on these items that we pointed out. And as Director Prosser referenced in the, in the the target of <clears throat> not having service costs grow faster than our CPI is an area where we're looking the long term. And we know there's going to be some ebbs and flows that we look at some uh, specifically into that regard. But uh, we're very encouraged. I'm very encouraged that we're having the conversations. We're consistently and constantly looking at that, at the strategic financial plan and associating that with our budgeting efforts. Uh, so I, you know, my hat's off to, you know, again, to the team and the efforts that we have. Uh, and to the board for being so focused in a long-term uh, plan and ensuring that the organization you know, achieves sustainability today and well into the future. So thank you, Dee, in, in leading your team and the great efforts that you guys are making. Excellent. We'll see no, nothing else. Is there a motion then to approve resolution 15-03-14? So moved. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion or questions? I guess I would just add that, again, this is not approved the budget for anybody watching this. This is approving the budget for submittal to the Tax Conservation, excuse me, tax, County Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission. And we will have the opportunity after the public input and, and as we move forward to make minor adjustments to the budget to reflect some of the things that we've been talking about earlier today. So I just want to get that on the record before we take action. And on mm -hmm. the record, uh, uh, so we don't forget, I'll be out of town next month. We can track you down. <laughs> I'll be on the metro system in oh, DC okay, good. in all business. Right. So, well, if we need you, we'll call you. All right. Uh, all right. Good idea. All right. <laughs> so we have a motion on table to approve resolution 1503-14. Uh, uh, all those in favor of the motion to approve the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, looking at the agenda, I see nothing else to come before the board this morning. Is there anything else from staff? Anything else from the board that we want to talk about this morning? Okay, then I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.